thank you all for being here today. Really appreciate the opportunity for you to spend half an hour, 45 minutes, wherever it's gonna to go to today as part of our Leader to Leader Roundtable. We've been doing a couple of these and um, really appreciate you being here. Dean Fountain um, is a wonderful leader in the College of Business at University of West Florida. And these roundtables really have brought out leadership and what it takes um, at any time. And so I would like to introduce our Dean, Dean Fountain, and from there, he'll introduce uh, each one of you, and then we're going to talk about leadership. We're just going to have a conversation. So this is our Dean, Dean Fountain. Can you do introductions? Hey, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Green. It's uh, really, I want to echo uh, Allie's comments. Thank you to the panelists for coming today. You're busy people, and uh, we know that you've taken time out to do this with us. And, with us. and I've heard Allie say that this is a time capsule that we're recording so that we learn about leadership and as we develop leaders in our academic programs. Uh, before I introduce, I want to make one comment. The topic today is leadership. And while we have so many folks in the healthcare profession that would be on top of COVID-19 answers and questions, it, it would not be fair to deviate from our content today. We have limited time, so I hope you can appreciate that. We will address leadership today, and uh, I want to introduce our panelists, and there are a couple times I might make a personal comment, but um, alphabetically, Bill Bailey is president and CEO of the Center Foundation. He's headquartered, and uh, I'm on his board in full disclosure in Texas. Uh, I know we have a great uh, alcohol and drug facility behavioral health here as part of Baptist Hospital, but I thought it might be good to bring someone from the outside that's dealt with large uh, residential a and I know Bill is a graduate of Texas Tech, and uh, he's been in this alcohol and drug now for about three decades. Uh, next is Dr. Banks. I really want to thank him. He's representing Okaloosa County today, and uh, we got him here because I want to hear what practitioners. Um, Bill Bailey has a lot of employees, most of you do, but Dr. Banks is running a medical practice. And in many instances, um, they had shutdowns for the small practitioner, a single practitioner. So I want to get his, uh, ask, uh, his uh, concept of leadership. And then um, next we have Mark Faulkner, who uh, I've heard speak at Rotary Clubs. I, I know Mark, he's the president and CEO of Baptist Healthcare. It's one of the larger community owned hospitals in the country, and they do a super job. Uh, Dr. Litvak is an orthodontist in private practice, and uh, I know him. His wife is on our advisory board for the College of Business, and he was kind enough to take time out. And I think he will be able to share with us a little different take on what leadership is when you get shut down for being non essential during the pandemic. Um, Adam Principe, as a PharmD from the University of Florida, I know, and I'm proud to tell you he's an MBA graduate of the University of West Florida. He's a CEO of Select uh, Specialty Hospital. Gay Nord is the CEO of West Florida Healthcare. That's an HCA company. I had the pleasure of meeting her earlier, and uh, she was kind enough to agree to come in today. I think she's been a CEO of four maybe different hospitals, if I'm correct on that. And then um, Don Rudolph, I met recently. She's the president of Ascension Sacred Heart Hospital, Pensacola. Uh, she spoke at our downtown Rotary Club, did a great job. And I'm so honored that all of you took time to join us today. And I'm gonna turn it back to Dr. Green and let's get to work on leadership. Thank you, Dean Fountain, appreciate that. I'm gonna launch it with just a general question. Um, as leaders, and you all have rich uh, experience in leadership, what helped you most, um, if you kind of look backwards in preparing um, during the pandemic, what traits did you pull, did you lean on uh, that worked for you? Now kind of looking back, uh, what are those traits? Anybody? Well, I'll, I'll jump in, I guess, to start. Um, there are certainly competencies that we have to rely on, like communication, decision-making, 
um, you know, just operations and like, but, but then there are the traits like you referenced. I think it's important during these times to be authentic um, and completely transparent. Here's the situation. Uh, to be vulnerable, we don't have all the answers and that's okay. Um, that we'll work through this together um, and to express that in a way that, that, that builds builds the team. And, and then probably the, the third would, would be a, sort of a calm confidence. Yeah, these are unprecedented times and as leaders, we're always on stage and so people are looking um, to us uh, to sort of set the tone in terms of uh, how we're going to manage uh, this process and, and our response. So uh, those would be probably the top three I would, I would, I would think of right now. Yeah, so I, 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 we've been hearing the same theme. Anybody else? Want to pull yeah. in some of their traits? From, Go ahead, Bill. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Banks. Um, from my point of view, it's been open communication. Mm. Because not only do my employees have concerns, but my patients have concerns. And I have concerns as running a business. So uh, we've actually changed things in my office. Instead of having a weekly meeting, we have a meeting every morning at 7 a.m. before we see patients. So we can address my concerns, my employees' concerns, because if I have an employee who's uncomfortable in the office, I need to find another outlet for them, either let them go home, pay them in a different way, or find another outlet for them. Luckily, that's not happened. But again, since I'm also a very high risk type patient population as an internist, we have to address my patient's concerns also. And the key thing is open communications with your employees so they can inform the patients of the things that we've done to help them stay safe. And also we've been um, quite open and being very flexible. Some patients do not wanna come into an office. So we let them park in the back of the office and I come out and address their needs at their car. Sometimes we do um, telemedicine, but surprisingly, I would say probably 75 to 80% of the patients, even during the peak of the um, pandemic, patients wanted to come into the office. So we made changes to only have one person in the lobby. If there's more than one person waiting, they sit in their car until we bring them back into the office. So open communications, number one, making sure you address your your employees and your patients' concerns, and also being very flexible has been very key for us. I think that's great. Ali, um, just a, a few thoughts on the question. I think uh, much like Mark said, um, just the ability to be calm under pressure. Um, our, our jobs obviously have a lot of pressure, generally speaking, but this is a different type of pressure, um, and it's ongoing. I mean, this has been prolonged, obviously, and I think just the ability to chart a course and rally a team, those would be two other traits that um, are, are always important, but in particularly in times like these, very, very important. I think for me, one of the things that's been important is common sense. There's so much information that is being thrown out there and you, you watch people jump from one direction to the other and you now even see some of the experts contradicting themselves. What they said six weeks ago or eight weeks ago, they're now saying to do something different. And I think as a leader, um, you have to do what everybody's saying about being transparent, you know, and, and being calm in your communications, but you also have to be a leader. Because I think right now, the example I use, you're on a ship and you're in a storm. And right now, everybody wants to make sure that the person who's holding the wheel is somebody that is aware, open in their communication, but they give everybody confidence that you know what you're doing. Cause there's sometimes right now, I don't know what I'm doing, but you know, with common sense, if you just kind of pay attention and listen to what's happening, you can give others the comfort to have confidence that even though you may not know exactly right now what to do, you're going to make good decisions based on your history with them and building that trust. Yeah, I have, to, I have to agree. Don, would you like to add? I was just going to offer, um, I've loved everyone's comments and, and completely agree. I think, you know, from a, the ecosystem that we live in here, I think the leadership trait that I've 
appreciated um, in reflection has been the cap of um, bringing forth capabilities of my team. You know, we kind of listed out the problems we needed to solve today, some, you know, futuristic problems that we saw coming, and then how can we make those assignments? And I think Mark said, you know, authenticity and vulnerability to say that that isn't coming from this seat. I need to hear from this group and please, you know, kind of coordinate that. And then at the end of the day, be decisive to say we need to move now and um, bring that team along in that thought process. So all of those traits to keep the, the complexity and fear um, working together, you know, um, fear of the unknown, fear of the next thing coming, um, where are our capabilities in our organization and who do we need to draw on to lead certain efforts um, to advance our initiatives. Uh, it's an unprecedented time, but I've been very pleased with the individual members of our team that they've just stepped up with their own leadership efforts to, um, make this a workable situation. Dr. Adam? Yeah, hey, Dr. Green. I was just gonna add, um, kind of building off of what Dr. Banks was talking about. Um, so one thing that's really helped me is uh, perspective, you know, understanding the perspective of others. Um, you know, us on this panel, we, we all understand kind of the pressure we've all each, you know, individually been under. Uh, but thinking about our direct care providers, um, the, the fear, the anxiety that they have, um, our patients, their families, uh, you know, I, I know we're, we're talking about COVID and I'm not going to get too many specifics, but I mean, obviously, you know, in our space, we've, we've had to go, you know, uh, and eliminate visitation, which has been um, mm -hmm. very, very difficult um, for the patients and their families. And uh, being empathetic to that situation, uh, being able to understand, um, you know, the, the sensitivity there the, the, and have some sympathy uh, for those patients. Uh, for those families and then again back to our direct care providers um, and just the anxiety and, and dealing with uh, the pandemic uh, and, and just working through those situations and, and then that comes back to a lot of what Don and Gay and, and, and Mark talked about with being calm, being decisive um, and, and being able to make those decisions that need to be made uh, in order to keep the uh, keep the ship moving forward uh, like, like Bill talked about. Yeah, and there definitely are a few common threads that we're hearing, and, it, and it's really funny. Um, some of the coaches also said the same things, and, and you look at this, so there are the commonalities. Dr. Litvak, did you want to add, uh, if you want to take off the mic and add? So, yeah, I, I love everything everyone said, and uh, I really like the analogy of, of the boat being in the storm, and when you look at the captain, do they look calm and confident uh, or do they look freaked out? So one thing I, I find myself reminding myself during that period, which was very stressful and the amount of information coming in every day was, was overwhelming because uh, I'm in so many different organizations. They're all sending emails uh, was to remain analytical was just to really kind of parse through this, this huge volume of data to, to try and get down to the core and make the best decisions possible. And then to share that with my staff in, in a way that's empathetic and transparent uh, of why you're making these decisions. Because, you know, we, we had to furlough staff, which I never saw coming, and um, explain to them why they were being furloughed. So that was, that was very troubling. Um, but given the amount of data we, we were taking in, um, th that's just the decisions we had to make to move forward. Yeah, and I think that's, that's everybody because we are in a data-driven world and making those decisions, it really bubbled up. And I'm seeing everybody nodding their head of we've done that. We've, we've done that in the College of Business as well, um, which I think, thank you, that leads into our next question. And this is a question that I would say, um, looking at it now, we're a few months, for, for some of us, it feels like many, many years ahead of where we were just a few months ago. But is there anything, any trait, leadership trait, that you would say to your pre-COVID pandemic start, what would you strengthen more? If you can give some advice to somebody of, boy, if I would have been stronger on this trait, or if I would have done this. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on that? Would you, would you give yourself some advice? Because I would, me, 
of how I could do it better, how I can strengthen so that I could, could, be, could be more effective. I'll, I'll jump in. I don't know. Um, I think uh, unlike maybe the private practices, you know, our census has been elevating in COVID. We are at a point now that we were worried about being in April, you know, so it was just kind of juggling, you know, vacations, um, taking time off, uh, self-care. So I think I would, you know, we kept saying this is a marathon, not a sprint, um, and really understanding what that means um, psychologically and emotionally um, preparing for this pandemic. So I think just self-awareness and maybe self-care as far as, you know, putting yourself in a position to be that calm, confident leader, um, I think so far so good, but I think if I looked back, I would have maybe scheduled my vacation in April and not now. I don't know how you feel, Mark and Gay, but um, I, I was thinking July would be a little better time to take some time off. That did not transpire, so. Okay. One of the things I've thought about um, with this question is, you know, I think, you know, we always feel like we're, we can always communicate more, but I, I, during, the beginning of the pandemic, I, looking back, I wish I would have upped our communication a little bit more. And, you know, I've learned over the, the weeks since, um, I think we've done a lot of that. And the other thing I've learned a lot about, and, and someone mentioned this earlier, is the whole the fear mitigation. You know, that was never a term that I even thought about was fear mitigation. Um, I mean, what we do every day in healthcare, obviously, we're always dealing with the pressures of the unknown. But um, I've learned a lot about hopefully how to be more proactive around alleviating fears and trying to think through what is going to be fearful for people as this has changed over time. Um, and hopefully I've built up some additional skills around that. So I don't, uh, I don't know that we would have done anything different. Uh, it, what I can tell you is, is that I've always been a big believer in the Admiral Stockdale's principle that you can't anticipate when something's going to stop. And doing drug and alcohol treatment with a thousand licensed beds and the clients that we see, you know, and, and what we deal with on a daily basis, um, this is just another day in the park. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's a challenge, but it's, I mean, and I, I, for healthcare, it's, it's a different challenge, but it's just another challenge. And I just kind of think in our world today and the last several years and what I see for the rest of my career is that it's going to be a different flavor, but there's going to be another challenge coming. And it's just being uh, flexible and being agile and being willing to adapt. And learning would, along the way, I would add, Bill, if yeah. I could, um, because I see you all nodding. But part of this is the strength, again, looking again at all of you, the strength of where, where you are is you have to learn along the way, right or wrong, right? Dr. Banks, you want to add to that? Yeah, I think uh, when we uh, first hit the pandemic, I wish I'd been a little bit more flexible. It took me about two to three weeks to start telemedicine. It took us about a month to realize a patient who has fears to come into the office can't do telemedicine because a lot of your older patients don't have smartphones. Let them come to the parking lot and I can go to the parking lot and see them. I wish we had worked through some of the some of those ways so we could accommodate more patients from the beginning because a lot of times you have to realize you can't treat everybody the same way you know when you have the young healthy 20 year old you can treat them totally different as opposed to somebody who's in their 80s with COPD so you really have to be very flexible to accommodate their needs so I think that was the one thing I wish we had done a little bit earlier being a little bit more flexible and looking ahead and being a little bit more proactive. Mm, proactive is a great word as well. Mark? Yeah, a couple of thoughts. First um, is, although we talked about it, we thought about it, maybe we were a little hopeful that this, this is not gonna be a marathon. It might be a sprint, it's a marathon. And so I, I think the way we deal with stressful events are often you know, uh, fairly time constrained, limited. Uh, obviously, this is uh, more of a chronic, stressful situation. You have the pre traumatic stress of what's going to happen, what's coming. 
we're in the middle of the stressful times right now, and then I'm sure we'll look back with, with a bit of PTSD. <laughs> so just building the resilience to manage chronic stress, uh, which is different, um, and the physiological effects and psychological effects are different than a, a short-term event like a hurricane that we recover from. So I think I would try to recognize uh, as was stated, just sort of the emotional effect that this is having uh, on the caregivers and the community as well. The second probably would be uh, just, just managing the facts. You know, we often as leaders, we don't have all the facts when we make the decisions. And that's just part of having to move at a fairly rapid pace. But in this event, we've had to make decisions with limited information, with changing information as we learn more about the nature of the virus. So I think just, just focusing on the facts and not the speculation, not the, um, the skepticism or even the political nature of the, of the issue, focus on the facts. I understand that it's evolving and lead from that end. Yeah, that's terrific advice. Anybody else want to add to that? What would you kind of tell your pre-COVID leadership self? I'm just looking to see if anybody wants to. I'm not trying to be funny, but to tell, tell your pre-COVID self, it's going to be okay. You know, kind of like Mark said, uh, you know, we're, we're going to get through this. Uh, it is more of a more of a marathon at this point. Um, maybe an Ironman, Mark, right? Uh, but uh, it's... You know, and, and but we'll get through it, and we'll all get through it together. You know, everybody that's on this uh, this panel now, and, and obviously our, our respective teams. And uh, I think just making sure that again, we talked about it, just that open communication and transparency with our teams, uh, and being an, an encourager. You've got to be the biggest cheerleader um, for your team, uh, you know, from, from the top down. You know, really bottom up. You know, with us. Um, and so, so yeah, I just you know, it, we're gonna we're gonna be okay, uh, and we're gonna we're gonna get through this. Okay. Probably stronger. Anybody else want to add? I'm, I'm, Go I'm, ahead. Not health, I'm not in healthcare, but something that uh, occurs to me, Allie, is that we really did a great job on internal communication. We kept our people as informed as we could. We had almost hourly meetings, and I think looking back now, there's two two things I would change: is I would start my external communication. Because I've been talking with several of you about being on our college of advisor, our college of business advisory council, and we we kind of lost that in the process of making sure we were leading internally. So uh, y'all have been talking about life goes on. We have to continue those external things um, that we do, and so that would be one thing I would probably um, tell myself to do a better job. And the other is we've learned so much from these roundtables. We have a lot of breaking news on the early ones. I, I think we would have started these uh, earlier and I think we will continue them. Uh, as the pandemic goes away, we can learn from you. And I think that uh, your willingness to do this, we can't take you away every month, but I think we, I think we can do a better job of engaging with leaders. So thanks for letting me share, Allie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I have to agree with um, Dean Fountain and looking back, I think we do that in general as you're leading and, and further down the road is just strengthening those things that worked. And one thing that I've heard most of you say is about communications in one way or another. And what I'm mostly interested in, um, because we're talking, oh, excuse me while my um, thing goes, I have to get up. I'm just gonna go keep going and I'll do it in a minute. There it goes. Um, is communication plan and do you have a formal communication plan because each one of you and even as we were waiting i know that don and i were talking about what she does is huddling which is really cool and i'd love for you to talk about that a little bit more do you have a formal communication plan and then does that also incorporate where we're at today all of us talking on zoom right um it, it's it's not perfect, 
but it's a really great way now to all have the conversation. So I'm really interested to know, again, we say communications is one of the traits, um, probably you know, the, the highest trait that all leaders need to have. But did you have a formal communications plan? And that could include electronics. How did it work for you? Um, I know in the College of Business, we were flipping between Google Meet, WebEx, and then we finally got into when we figured out we're going to have to do this on a solid platform. How does that look? So I'm really interested because some of your organizations are large and we have smaller organizations, but the common thread is, is communication. So can we talk, if, if you wouldn't mind sharing or, or whatever you can share about communication plan and your thought of it? or even going forward. Well, I'll jump in. I um, surely don't want to jump ahead of anyone, but you know, with this pandemic, we set up incident command. So it has an inherent type of um, communication structure, but I would say two parts. First of all, you know, our life kind of pivoted when we sent a lot of people home to work. So the virtual um, capacity enhanced and so we looked at the meetings that we have and how do they move to a virtual format? And so we had transitioned to Google uh, last fall. So we have a Google Meet platform. And then I frankly was not thrilled about it. I'm an old Microsoft girl. So I was like, oh great, you know, one more change I have to adapt to. But I will tell you having the ability to collaborate real time in documents when you're updating um, resources, staff lifting listings at a macro scale to have everybody have us you not know, have to email documents around. We can just share them um, through the Google platform um, was very helpful to us over that. So we, we adapted to that as we moved virtually this this new form of collaboration. Um, worked very well for us. Uh, and then I would say then during the pandemic, once we were making those moves, then it was the enhanced communication that we're all talking about. You know, how do we get out to our stakeholders um, and, I, and fully identifying who those stakeholders were, you know, our associates, our medical staff, um, our external, you know, advisory com um, committees and, and whatnot. And then how do we get them looped into a, almost what we would call a communications cascade. So if we start out in the morning with this group, how do we continue to loop that, that same, those same talking points across, you know, 3000 people so that they were getting as much real time communication as what was coming out of incident command. And then I'm, I'm sure much like um, others in the room, we have then a regional and a national communications cascade. So just trying to develop those efficient, um, uh, channels, I guess is the right word, so that the messaging was as efficient as possible out to the front line. Yeah. Uh, Bill, I thought I saw you. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. I mean, we've got facilities from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, to Amarillo, Corpus Christi. So we've got over a dozen facilities in different regions. And so uh, the first thing we did is uh, we had our director of nursing start every morning off with an email to all staff. You know, and simple stuff sometimes, wash your hands, wear your mask. He often would also catch some of the latest news coming out and would break it down. And when people would talk about different treatments to give a layman's perspective of what was being said, which that seemed to take a lot of stress down. Uh, when it started, I was doing three, three to six webinars a week. I would do some, you know, at 10 o'clock in the morning, I'd do them at midnight uh, for night staff. Uh, you know, giving the same, you know, package message, but then also answering questions, uh, letting staff ask what their greatest concerns were. Um, you know, we, uh, we deal with a, uh, some of our clients are of the indigent population, so they come with a whole bunch of issues. Uh, we started posting a lot of things on Facebook, uh, graduates of our program talking about how good it was, and posting on as appropriate clients that talked about being in their addiction and out in the community, and it was safer to be in our facility than it was to be out in the community uh, mm -hmm. and, and coming in to get treatment. Um, and so we've used a multitude. You know, we did the, we call the commitment pay, but our frontline staff all got a $2 an hour increase while we had the shelter in place. You know, salary staff got, I think we did 500 to 500 a month. 
but we did across the board salary increases for non-executives immediately. And then as the uh, shelter in place started coming down, we dropped it back off. But um, we didn't have any staff refuse to come to work, which for a lot of treatment programs, some lost their staff, uh, a lot of pulled back. Uh, we were deemed essential, so we kept operating. Um, and, and, and that was kind of uh, unusual because most treatment programs have seen the drop off in population are in need, and ours has pretty much uh, stayed uh, consistent uh, uh, throughout the, this time. But, um, you know, I think it's, it, it, it was the willingness to answer questions. We've had some flare ups. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, I don't know, we've had probably 80 plus staff and clients test positive out of over, you know, 200 and something people that, you know, quarantined that, you know, thought they were exposed. But I mean, we, we have had, I believe, 85% of everybody return back to work. Um, and so we've had, it's been very mild, but I mean, uh, one of our facilities had a real flare up. So I went there for uh, 24 hours up to Tyler, Texas, and I worked as what we call a behavioral health tech, and I helped serve meals. I served uh, lunch, dinner, breakfast, and lunch. And in my free times, empty trash cans and did the sanitation in bathrooms and went around and sprayed the deatomizer in the vehicles and everything. And, uh, you know, staff put that on Facebook, you know, and staff are posting about it. So it's kind of, if Bill's going to come out and be in the middle of this and do it, then we can do it. And it, you know, it, it was putting leadership into action and standing with them and doing the jobs that, you know, the, the lowest jobs. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think sometimes that's the best part of leadership is that I enjoy is, is serving meals and cleaning up dirty trays uh, because it takes everybody's stress down. If, if they see me doing it, then what, what do you have to be concerned about? Mm -hmm. It really is pulling everybody together. And I agree with that. And yeah, and you, you started, Bill, thank you. You started talking about a little bit about um, you would have different um, meetings and Zoom meetings and whatnot at different times. Uh, because most of, obviously, operations in a hospital are 24-7. So do, for anybody else with your communication plans, um, did you do something different that would be inclusive, or is that something that you all do, Mark? Um, yeah, so you're right. Uh, it is 24-7, so we have transitioned to a virtual platform, we have a tradition here of doing what we call employee forums. We're in the midst of those right now. Um, and we, when we normal, normally gather in meeting rooms, instead we're doing them virtually. We had one just a little while ago. Uh, the importance um, of, of really continuing to drive a culture. Culture is driven by open communication. It's driven by reward and recognition. It's driven by the opportunity to have an input and voice and decisions. It's feeling valued and connected to something bigger than you are. And that can't change in the midst of a pandemic. We still have to focus on the culture. So those, those methods, those drivers continue on. We just have to do them differently. In communication, there, there's a lot of messaging in that, incident command and what's happening and here's what we know. And, but communication is two-way. And so how can they um, have input? How can they voice their concerns? How can they ask their questions? Um, beyond just what happens at the unit level, but to, to the entire organization, creating um, uh, the opportunities for them to ask questions and share their concerns through, through email and through other ways uh, so that we, it's two-way and we understand what their needs are, what their questions are, and we can address those as well. I think it's important to, to be predictable and consistent. You know, I, Take another message this morning. There, every two weeks, I'm going to be videoing a message to, to team members and board members, uh, just because they, they, they know it's coming. Instead of it being sporadic and unpredictable, I think there's some semblance of regularity with that as well. Very good. Yeah, and 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 the consistency, even and we started talking about communication plans and what the plan is, um, and when you execute the plan. And the consistency, even if we didn't have it, if we started it, we're expecting to continue it. And that is, if I can kind of pluck that out a little bit, that is a lesson learned of maybe 
to strengthen, as Dr. Banks said, the flexibility of it, but then implement what really works. So I'm glad to hear that. Dr. Litvak, you, um, you, have, you have a comment with your mic off? Make sure the mic's off, thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you. I was gonna say one of our biggest challenges, concerns was would our patients come back once we were allowed to open back up? Would they feel safe? So that, that all started with the phone call, letting them know that things were gonna be different. You know, when they, when they came back in, letting the parents know um, from the time they pulled in the parking lot, you know, sit out in the car, we would come out and get them so we don't have a full waiting room. You know, taking the temperatures, surveys, where have they been? Have they been around anybody that's been, uh, you know, COVID positive? And we've, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback. We've had patients say that they're, we're like the only place they're, they're really willing to go other than maybe the grocery. Um, but I think that, that just took a lot of thought process uh, to implement that, that kind of message to make people feel safe. And I agree with that. And, and again, hearing um, for everybody is whether it's the patients, but you have the internal and external that all of you are dealing with at such greater levels uh, with the fear that was coming through. So thank you for that. Adam? I was just going to, you know, speaking about plans, um, communication plans, one of the plans we had to develop early, early on back in mid-March was communicating uh, with our families and coming up with a patient family communication strategy. Um, and we had to do that very, very quickly. Uh, so we had to be very nimble, um, but making sure, uh, again, coming back to that, that perspective and empathy and making sure that we were able to connect with those families. Um, we got iPads in the hospital. We were doing FaceTiming uh, with families. And I know a lot of you know my, my counterparts are doing that as well for, as their, their hospitals, uh, trying to provide that connectivity. Uh, and then on a, on a you know, employee or a team, team member basis, you know, we've transitioned from uh, around the table in a conference room to uh, standing huddles, uh, trying to honor social distancing. Uh, we moved from, uh, you know, kind of every other week uh, leadership meetings to daily leadership huddles. Uh, first thing in the morning, kind of getting our, our, our marching orders for the day. Um, so, uh, and, and just maintaining that consistency, like Mark talked about, I mean, that's super important so that people know what to expect, when to expect it, um, it has been very vital. Dr. Green, um, much like my colleagues, I mean, all of that communication obviously was part of a formal plan for us and, and has really evolved. And I think, you know, as many of us who are our leader, our, our leadership frequency, uh, the meet the frequency of those meetings has really been, um, you know, compressed and it's much more, you know, much more frequent on a daily basis. The only thing I would add is what I learned along the way was that we really still needed some type of touch point with our employees. I mean, it's one thing to do a WebEx and it's one thing to, you know, tape the WebEx and, and just make sure you're sending information out um, regularly, but we also realized we needed to to get out into the areas of the hospital so we we actually started doing roving town halls and what they really ended up being as we went around to all the departments was answering a lot of questions um, answering addressing a lot of concerns and the more we did that the less questions we had the less concerns that there were and i think the employees very much appreciated the fact that we were in the trenches with them you know much like bill mentioned um, and that seemed to work really well during a time that was, is very difficult. You know, you lose that human connection uh, sometimes with this virtual approach to things. I agree with that. And I agree, you know, it's, it's, it's a two way street with the communications, the plan. And as all of you are saying um, that I'm hearing that you strengthen certain things and you'll implement other things, but what also is missing is the human touch. Mm -hmm. And we're all in that business of, it is about humans and it is about um, connecting. And if this did nothing else as leaders is to almost accentuate that, that we cannot forget that um, because you do that naturally as leaders. And um, I can't, uh, Mark, I think you said being authentic 
um, is, you know, that's probably the highest that the, the leadership is being authentic and transparent. So um, thank you, Gay, for, for bringing that out. I appreciate that. Um, so uh, Dean Fountain, before I bring in some of the questions that were asked from outside, uh, what are your thoughts? What questions you have? It's, it's kind of an open discussion at this point. I know you have many. Well, really, I'm interested to see what our, our external participants are asking. I, I, Dr. Banks didn't have a chance to speak. I wanted to make sure he didn't have a comment on that last uh, oh. question. Actually, I agree with it. What everybody else said, it's mainly communication and being honest with your patient, with your patients and employees, because if, if you're not honest and transparent and they catch you, then they're not going to trust you again. And as long as they know that you have their best, uh, you, you, you want the best for them, they will trust you. And they'll also, uh, I'll, they've done wonderful during this period of time, at least in my office. That's an amazing, sorry, Dean Fountain, I'm going to jump in because you're still muted, but the trust, that is, that is such a high, high trait and um, inherently none of us said that. So thank you so very much. Um, go ahead. I'm sorry, Rick. Go I look ahead. like Mrs. Rand Ms. Rudolph, do, do you have another comment? Look like you unmuted. Yeah. I just wanted to add, I appreciate what everyone was saying. And I, uh, in reflection, I started a Facebook page um, out of my office, just happenings. And I was really impressed by the feedback on it. Not that I'm a great social media expert by any means. In fact, it kind of worries me. <laughs> so I did it with a little bit of trepidation, but the ability for our associates to consume that information on their time and then the ability for them to, you know, post and recognize each other through a, um, one thought or one picture or, or something that's a little more lighthearted and not an official memo, but a, a kind of an interpretation of what's happening. Uh, it was, it's been really gratifying to see that um, forum be embraced by several of our associates and um, just broader members and, and say, you know what, we're, we're, putting, remembering to put information out that way and uh, that they consume it on their own time. And I, I kind of um, forget, and we mentioned the 24 seven aspect of it. So it just gave the ability, even the messenger piece of it to be able to get a thread going around the thought in a very um, non-official, more cheerleading type of way. So. And one, I'm gonna add on to that, um, Don, is, is that you were mentioning about using Google and having that platform for people to see things. And I just wonder, you know, there's probably a learning curve that came into this on top of kind of the stress of everything else. So um, I agree with, with the communication. Um, Dean Fountain, what else are your well, thoughts? I, I have thought, if anyone wants to jump in, please, please do. But during the course of making calls to ask you to serve on this, a couple of you mentioned that uh, this had caused all of you to have more time to talk with one another about how you're doing things, more collegial uh, in the healthcare in general in our, in our area. And we, we had originally planned to try to do this face to face because of that human touch. So I'm hoping at some point down the road, we'll, we'll be able to have you out to uh, time with Stanglewood and give you a chance to see what we're doing. But uh, I was touched by that, that leaders uh, lead. You just naturally reached out to each other and you did things uh, um, that seemed to make sense, that you worked together and you, you learned from each other. So that, that was a real lesson in leadership to me when we did that. And Allie, I, I think we're, we're uh, probably getting near the end of our time. Do you have some questions from viewers that you want to, uh, participants you want to ask? Yeah, if, if we can, and uh, if you wouldn't mind, again, some of these, um, I would say, I'll, I'll throw it out. Anybody can answer it. You can answer as much as you want or not, I think, in all fairness. Um, most of the questions are coming in regarding staffing. 
regarding how are they holding up? How are they doing? Um, you know, not specifically about turnover, but it's, it's stressful for everybody. So, so that's one of the questions is, how is the staff holding up? Well, I'll, I'll um, jump in there. I, I would say first that they're holding up remarkably well, considering um, it is a very trying and stressful time and it's been so prolonged. And, you know, I think everybody's mentioned, you know, there's that element of exhaustion and, you know, kind of re trying to re-energize. And I think as leaders, we're constantly trying to re-energize the organization. But, you know, frankly, our staff re-energize us. Um, they do, do such an amazing job. And while this is what they signed up for and you know, taking care of patients is what they do every day, um, it's pretty amazing that the resiliency is pretty amazing. So overall, they're, you know, I would say they're in good spirits. They're tired. I mean, this is, you know, is starting to really wear on, but I think they, um, they're taking care of each other as well. Um, so that's always nice to see. And I think Mark talked about culture and you know, that at the end of the day, if you start to see your staff taking care of each other in that way, I think it says a lot about our organization, so. Yeah, it's neat to see. Bill, you're first, go ahead, and then I'm gonna to go to Mark after that. Yeah, I think one of the things is, I mean, we've had some staff that, you know, a lot of our staff in recovery, so we have a high uh, group of very mission-driven staff, and, uh, you know, they've kind of, they have rallied you know, I think for some of the staff, they've been able to hold each other accountable, which is taken too often. It falls to leadership to try to hold those standards. And when you have your staff have it within the culture, it maintains itself a lot better. It, uh, when a manager has to come in and realign staff or get them to pay attention to their jobs, it's, it's seen as heavy handed, if you will. When it comes from the team, it's much more encouraging. And so we've been very focused on that prior to the pandemic, which I think that's helped carry us into the pandemic and kept us in a much better place. Yeah, that's, that's the peer to peer. Thank you very much. Mark? I'll, I'll let go um, what Bill and Gates said. Resilient staff, there's peer accountability, it matters. They're mission driven, you know, going to this uh, field to make a difference. And, um, often in these trying times, it, it sometimes brings out the worst in people in society, but often brings out the best. And certainly we're seeing that with our staff. I think it also is valuable the way the community has wrapped themselves around the caregivers. Those expressions of gratitude, the acknowledgement of them being on the front line in this particular situation, that inspires them. Really is very meaningful to our team, and we're grateful for for the community that's reached out the way it has. Yeah, that is neat. And it, from the outside, it's really cool to see, and um, I'm glad that that's happening. And I'm glad it's continuing, and it needs to continue along with the um, triathlon, as Adam said. Who else would like to? How's your staff doing? Anybody else? To, no? Okay, so if you'd like to hop on in, um, otherwise I'm going to take a look at another question. We probably have time for one more. Um, it says that it, it let me let me reiterate what it says is um basically the culture so the culture do you feel as if during the time of pandemic that your culture shines through or is it time to escalate that to the next level i think what that's asking is do you add new things during the time and change them or do you just go with what you know before and what you're good with before? You didn't build it before the pandemic. You're not going to find it in the pandemic. Okay. Good. Uh, I'll just, you know, speak to culture. And I loved what Mark and Gabe both said about our staff and resiliency, and that's part of their mission. So, you know, I think everyone, particularly here around Pensacola, you know, that's our mission, and we've accepted it. Um, 
So I think that culture was just affirmed through all of this, that, you know, this is what they signed up for, as Gay said, um, the wrapping around of the community. Uh, I think it's really proved out vocation. Um, I think it's pr uh, proved out to us that, um, as Adam said, we can get through all of this. And so I think it actually recommits us to our purpose. Um, you know, re has us rethinking about less about self and more about others, you know, uh, because we were all in it together. And we have this program called Helping Hands, and we've had uh, people from the children's hospital over on the adult side. We've had people from finance helping in the lab, you know, just different places to say, gosh, we are part of an organization. And it's not just about my unit or um, in my mission and purpose through my unit, but just collectively and collaboratively. So as tired as we are, um, I think there has been a kind of a rejuvenation and spirit of um, yep, we're in this together, and um, and I would just extend that to my colleagues, Gay and Mark. I mean, we text each other. We feel like we're in it together. Back to your point, um, Dean Fountain, um, I don't know that we would have done that organically. I think that, you know, I think we would have been very collegial, but I think we're friends now. Um, we certainly understand each other's um, perspective in this issue, and so even our own vocations, I think, have been reaffirmed during this time. Boy, that's from a humanistic side, that's a great thing to hear. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that our leaders here are doing that. Mark, you came off of mic. What are your What are your thoughts? Would echo exactly what Don said. I mean, we're, th there's a recognition that this is why we're here. This is our purpose as an industry is to help people. Yeah, and um, now more than ever, it, it matters the work that's being done, and I think our people can naturally connect that. Uh, in their mind and in their heart to that purpose. And it's evident whether they're taking care of the people or they're taking care of the people who take care of those people. It's, it's, um, it's just an opportunity to reinforce the methods that drive the culture. And yeah, we've had to be flexible and change some things. Um, you know, when we focus on team member engagement, for example, and we're about to do our annual survey in about 10 days. Mm -hmm. We have 2,000 people working from home now. How's it, you know, how do we, refresh the methods that drive the culture. And so that's, that's an ongoing challenge and it's something that is it's enjoyable to do. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Banks, Dr. Litvak, I'm interested in, um, because from a different perspective, however, culture is important no matter where you are. So either one of you wanna un unmute and let us know. At least, in, at least in my office, um, we have been open every day uh, through the entire pandemic. We've seen patients in the office and it, I've seen a great sense of teamwork beyond what I've seen in the past with my employees. They don't argue, they don't fight. I've had one employee and I only have five employees in my office. I've had one employee who had to self quarantine for 10 days. The other employees stepped up and patients have been wonderful because they realize we're a little bit stressed, we're in the forefront, and they have been very gracious knowing if we're running behind, uh, you know, they, they know that we're doing our best. But uh, definitely teamwork, and it's almost like my, my employees see that it's their duty to help others when they come into the office. And I've been very impressed with the teamwork that they've come together and it's actually brought our office closer during this time. Need to hear Dr. Lipa. I would say one of the biggest changes I saw in our culture is that I started a group tax with about 11, 12 other orthodontists during sort of the, the height of, of the, the pandemic. Uh, and about right before we, we went into furlough is it ended up, I think every office did. Um, and that sort of collegiality uh, or friendliness, I'd never really seen in the orthodontic community before, at least in Northwest Florida. You know, my father was an orthodontist. Uh, we're, we're, we're pretty well saturated with orthodontists in Northwest Florida. So here's that uh, natural sense of competition. But I'd like to think that, that we're going to see this extend out uh, into the future. And I think people will be more willing to, to reach out to each other because uh, 
feel like maybe those barriers have been broken down a little bit. But it, it was really nice to see. Yeah. And I do hope so too, because it sounds like from now, it, it's just an opening to strengthen it up a little bit. Adam, did you want to add any comments to the culture question? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I would just uh, echo what everybody's been saying. I mean, I, I think these challenging times um, really just, just if you have the right culture, um, if you've been you know, working on that right culture, it just really starts to shine through. Um, if it doesn't, then there's a problem, uh, I, I think. And so, um, you know, for us, the teamwork, uh, honesty, you know, open communication, uh, open door policy, just transparency with the leadership team, uh, connecting uh, with our uh, frontline, you know, workers, our, our nurses, our CNAs, uh, making sure that they know that we're there, we're, we're right in the trenches with them. Um, and so that, that connectivity has been huge for us. And, and that, that has probably strengthened a little bit through this, uh, of making sure that, that they know uh, from a leadership team uh, that we're right there with them. Um, and we've got part of our leadership team coming up here tonight uh, to make sure they connect to the night shift on the safety huddle round, uh, just to give some new information that, that's been coming down. So um, again, you know, culture, you know, nothing's changing right now. It's just developing and, and getting better, uh, I think. And, and I think that was you know, really what everybody has said. Uh, if you've got the right culture, it, it shines during these times. Wonderful. Yeah, everybody. That's, that's great to hear. I personally, again, want to thank you for your time, your, your busy, busy schedule. And thank you for what you're doing in the community. My hope to you, each one of you, is that you take care of yourselves first, because uh, I know that your, your efforts are with your employees, with the patients, with everything that's going on in the community. Um, so I hope you will do that for yourself. And I'm gonna allow, um, allow I'm gonna please, Dean Fountain, please um, say just a couple of, because we're at two o'clock, concluding comments, um, and then we'll bid farewell. I'm, I'm struck by something I learned practicing law. Clients would come to me and they were in a, a dispute with a partner or uh, in a customer relationship. And we used to always say, well, desperate times cause desperate people to do desperate things. Well, I don't know that we call this desperate times, but these are difficult times. And, and what I come away with today is the sense of great leadership faces those times. And so we're not desperate people doing things. When you're prepared to be a leader. And what we hear you describe today is leadership. And we come, the leadership comes to the fore. Uh, whether it's working with your colleagues that maybe you were collegial before, but you're just trying to reach the best result. That's, that's true leadership. So thank you for leading today by coming here and sharing with us and uh, our students and uh, our stakeholders at the University of West Florida and College of Business. I can't thank you enough for taking this time, and I hope we can reconvene in the future, hopefully at the College of Business Advisory uh, Council or at uh, Timeless Tanglewood and have a chance to have that human inter interchange that we talked about today. Uh, you're so kind to, to visit with us today. I want to thank you for that, and uh, I hope we'll get together again soon.